Good day. Thank you so much for joining us at Rama South Coast Family Church. As you listen or watch this DVD, our prayer for you is that your life will be inspired, that you'll grow spiritually, and that you'll get to know your Father in heaven in a deeper and greater way. Enjoy the teaching. Well, we want to conclude this morning uh, a series we've been doing called What's in a Name? And we we really have studied out the importance uh, of a name, especially relating in the Bible, uh, how significant and powerful a name is because it represented a person's character, it represented their attributes, it represent, represented who they are. In today's society, names aren't that much of a big deal. But I want you to know in Bible times, it was a big deal. And we've gone uh, four weeks. This is the fifth week. And so if you haven't been here, you can go down to our webpage. You can download and listen to the podcast. You can download the teaching notes so that you have something to study during the week. And we'd encourage you to do that. You can also go to our information bar and you can order the DVDs or the CDs. And I'd really encourage you to do that. We can't obviously recap every week. But our scripture, our text scripture has been Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let's just pray, Father, as we go to your word today, we honor you, we thank you for your word, that it is alive and powerful. We welcome the Holy Spirit who is our teacher to teach and guide and lead and cause fresh revelation and understanding to come forth from your word this morning in Jesus' name. Now over the weeks we've looked at, uh, from the Old Testament, we've looked at the names of God. We looked at the name Elohim. We looked at the name Yahweh and we gave descriptions and definitions for that. We saw that God is our peace. We saw that God is our healer. We saw that God is our banner and our victory. We've seen last week that God is our provider. God is our righteousness. And how many of you know the Lord is our shepherd? And so this morning, uh, as we conclude, uh, we're going to do uh, just two names, and you're going to be so blessed this morning. But the first one uh, is called Yahweh Mekadishkem. Yahweh Mekadishkem. And it actually means the Lord who sanctifies. The Lord who sanctifies. Let's turn to Exodus 31, and we're going to read uh, two verses here. And I encourage you to go read the whole chapter at home later on because it will minister and bless you. But it says here, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign, please remember that, between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I am Yahweh Mekadeshken. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Whoever does, not, uh, does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. The Lord who sanctifies. The word sanctifies means to make clean. It means to dedicate or to appoint. It, it, it means to set apart as a prize or a possession. How I many you know the Lord is the one who sets us apart for his kingdom? And he doesn't take us out of the world, but he does what I like to call heart surgery. He likes to take the world out of us. Can you say amen? He doesn't want you to go out of the world now. He wants you to make a difference in the world. And so he's in the process of taking the world out of us. He sets us apart from a lifestyle of selfishness, from a lifestyle of sin, and from a life, life of emptiness. And he sets us apart into a life of righteousness, a life of purpose, and a life of meaning in Christ. You have meaning this morning in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Now, the purpose of the Sabbath, please remember this, it's so important. The purpose, God said in, in Exodus here, the purpose of the Sabbath was to remind them that they would know that He is the Lord who sanctifies them. Not the pastor, not your wife, 
Not your husband, not anyone else. Who's the one who sanctifies you? The Lord is the one who sanctifies you and sets you apart. All right? And he wanted them to remember that. He is the one. He said, I want you to know that I am Jehovah Mekodeshkem. This name speaks about and, and relates to us the passion that God has and the commitment he has to work in your life this morning as your sanctifier. He wants to make you clean. He wants to set you apart. He wants you to be his prized possession. Can you say amen? Bump the person next to you and say, work with him now. You see, he sets us apart and he gives us the ability or the power to, to live and to be in total submission to Him. I love the, the song choices this morning, uh, speaking about surrender. And we need to focus this morning and understand Jesus is our sanctification. Jesus is our holiness. How many know you cannot make yourself holy this morning? You, you cannot make yourself sanctified this morning. Jesus is the one that accomplished that. And I want you to know when God looks at us, He looks at us through His Son, Jesus Christ. He's the one who's working in our lives. And uh, I want you to know that the regular observance of the Sabbath day was there to remind Israel that they were a chosen race, that they were a holy nation that had been set apart to serve God as his prized possession. We would do well this morning if we continue to remember that you are set apart as God's prized possession. Uh, the, the Bible says God is jealous over you with a jealous love. He wants to guard you, protect you, and he wants you to display his glory through your life. And how many know that is a, a journey and it is a process? We need to remember this morning that Jesus is our Sabbath. I know there's a lot of controversy and, and different teaching in the church today about Sabbath and what day it is and do we observe the Sabbath. But the reality this morning, Jesus is your Sabbath. That means every day you're to live for Jesus. You need to honor Jesus. Can you say amen? And I want you, if you'll just remember that this morning, it will revolutionize the way you live, the way you do life, the way you run your business, the way you, you treat your family. Because if every day is set apart to serve Jesus, how many of you know that should be your focus and your intention? Now, I've got nothing wrong. I believe in the Sabbath. I believe that one day a week we should rest. I believe that one day a week we should come to church and serve God. I don't have a problem with any of that. But how many of you know, if you just think that's what it is, then it means the other six days you can live how you want. And how many of you know, you can't. If you're going to serve God, if you're going to be His prized possession, if you're going to maximize God's purpose for your life, then I want you to know it's a daily thing where you allow Christ into your life to work in your life. And so Jesus is your Sabbath. Every day is holy. And I want you to know as we obs observe a day of rest, as we learn to rest, how many of you know the Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father? And he ever lives to make intercession. You know, Jesus is the one that takes your prayers and he makes them acceptable to God. Jesus is the one this morning that takes you and he presents you to the Father and says, This is one of your children. It's by the grace of God and the power of God. Grace is not an excuse to live the way you want. Grace is an empowerment to live the way God wants you to live. Look at the person next to you and say, this is good preaching this morning. Tell them you must get saved. Let me give you a scripture. 1 Peter 2 verses 9 to 12, a New Testament version of this exact Jehovah Mekadeshkem. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. I think Peter wanted us to get it. I know he could have just used one of those descriptions, but he wanted us to get it this morning. You are chosen. You are royal. You are holy. You are special. Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What did he, he call you? Out of darkness. Say out. out. Come on, say it with a bit of passion. Say out. out. In. In. Out of darkness. Out of darkness. Into light. 
called you out of darkness into light. Why? Who, uh, into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fresh, fleshly lusts, which war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Listen, good works don't earn favor with God, but good works are a result of you having earned favor with God. We do good works because of God's favor, not to get his favor. Can you say amen? Are you getting some help this morning? Let me quickly give you three aspects of sanctification that just help us to uh, understand this and how it practically plays out in our lives. There are three aspects of uh, sanctification. There's positional sanctification, progressive sanctification, and ultimate sanctification. Let me talk to you about that just for a second. Positional sanctification. Hebrews 10 verse 10 says, but by that we... Sorry, by that will we, having been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What is that? That's in the past tense. Having been sanctified. Listen, when you got saved, God literally set you apart. That is your position today. I've got two sons. And I want you to know today, nothing they ever do will change the fact that they are my sons. Hello? Now listen, what they do might change how much fellowship we have, how much interaction we have, and how much input we have, but they will always be my sons. I will always love them. I'm, I might not always agree with what they do. That's position. Can you say amen? God loves you. God is committed to you. God cares about you. God has set you apart. However, we need to realize this morning that there is the, 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 the reality of progressive sanctification. Let's look at it here in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. It says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. How? By the Spirit of God. As you listen to the Word, as you read the Word, as you allow the Holy Spirit to cause the Word of God to come alive, you start to behold the glory of God. As you respond to the glory of God in your life, you're progressively becoming more like Christ. Can you say amen? It's an ongoing pro process. And then number three, ultimate, it says in Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself, that he might present her to himself. Notice who's doing the work, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish how many know the day is coming when christ will come back for the church and i want you to know he will present the church to himself a holy sanctified powerful awesome body can you say amen look at the person next to you say i'm looking forward to eternity now if they looked a little bit dull if like a like a dullness came over their eyes when they said that watch them when we do the altar call because you need to be saved if you're not excited about that one. Can you say amen? All right, let me give you a scripture as we close out this name this morning. And I encourage you, you can go study it. In a couple of weeks, I'll do a teaching on the Sabbath just so that we can understand it a little bit more fully. But in Hebrews 9.28, it says, Even so it is that Christ, having been offered to take upon himself and bear as a burden the sins of many once and once for all, will appear a second time not to carry any burden of sin, nor to deal with sin, but to bring full salvation to those who are eagerly waiting for and expecting him. Is there anyone in the house this morning, you are eagerly waiting and expecting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you say it? Looking forward to the coming of Christ. Come on, give the Lord praise in the house if you believe that this morning.
Now, as we start to conclude this series this morning, I want you to know every week we've seen how Jesus is revealed through the names of God. But I want you to know that there's no better way to finish a series like this. And we haven't got near to the names of God. There's over 265 different names. So we've, we've covered about 12 of them. But I want you to know this morning, I want to talk to you about the name of Jesus. Jesus, the I am. And I want you to know that as we talk about the name of Jesus, as we've studied the names of God over the couple of weeks, I want you to know we've, begin to, we've begun to learn who he is. We've begun to learn how big he is, how powerful he is, how wonderful he is. And I want you to know, as you learn to know who God is and what he is, what his attributes are, it builds faith in your heart. It, it strengthens your belief system. I want you to know what you believe this morning is very important because how many of you know you can't trust someone you don't believe? And I want you to know out of, out of your belief, out of your trust for God, faith grows, faith develops. And we, we read in our, our leading scripture, without faith it is impossible to please God. So, so learning to know God and, and understanding and believing Him is so important. And I want you to know, we can see the name of Jesus. We can see the character of Jesus in every single book of the Bible. Do you know that this morning? Jesus is revealed in every single book of the Bible. Genesis through Revelation. Look at Revelation 21 verses 5 and 6. It said, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Please underline that and remember that this morning. I believe God wants to make some things new this morning. And through the word of prophecy and tongues and interpretation, I believe that was confirmed. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you drink of the water I'm giving you, you will never thirst again. When, when you understand the reality of who Jesus is in your life, as you learn to grow into and develop in your relationship with God, you never have to worry or thirst again because Jesus will fill you to overflowing. It's quite remarkable, the statement in the Greek language, because the Alpha and the Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Um, you know, it's out of the alphabet that we make up words. And we know today that Jesus Christ is called the Word of God. In other words, Jesus this morning is the full, intelligent revelation and communication of who and what God is. Uh, the beginning and the ending refers to the reality that Jesus Christ is eternal. He's not just eternal, but he's the life-changing expression of the unchanging character of our God. You can believe God today. You might not be let, believe people. Your people might let you down. Things might go wrong because of this fallen world we live in. But I want you to know today, you can trust God. You can believe in Jesus. Can you say amen? And when you start to build that as a foundation in your life, it will start to strengthen you and help you because you can trust God's integrity. You see, as we see the bigness and power of God, our faith de develops and grows, and we begin to realize that the devil is no match for Jesus. Can you say amen? And I want you to know, if you are in Christ and if you stay in Christ and you begin to realize who you are in Christ, then I want you to know you can overcome the devil. He is no match for you if you're in Christ this morning. Now, if you're standing on your own and you're standing outside of Christ, I feel very sorry for you. But when you're facing life with Jesus, it makes all the difference. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means this morning that his attributes and his character and his integrity never changes. He is immutable. In other words, it's impossible for him to change. He is the beginning and the end and he encompasses everything, all time and all eternity. Let's look at the power of this from John chapter 1 and we'll just read a few verses here. I want to read firstly verse 1 to 5. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him 
And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 14 of John 1 says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16 and 17 says this, And of his fullness, speaking about Jesus, we have all received grace for grace, and for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful this morning? Jesus, the expression of our Father. Now, God's grace and truth is revealed in and through Jesus. Therefore, our life and our purpose is found and fulfilled in Christ Jesus. As, as we come to know him and, and, and the beauty of his majesty, as we come to allow his life and his spirit to live in us through the word of God and through interaction with, with other believers, I want you to know his purpose starts to be fulfilled in our lives. We don't have to strive and work hard to please God. We rather need to rest and trust in his amazing grace that empowers us to live our daily life. Psalm 138 verse 2 says this, I will worship toward your holy temple and I will praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Now listen to this next statement. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Who is the word of God this morning? Jesus is the word of God. We just read that in John chapter 1. What, what the scripture is saying is, above everything, above even all the names of God, Jesus is exalted above all of that. His word is truth. His word is life. His word is healing. So let's go this morning on a, on a little journey, and, and we're going to look at Jesus in every book of the Bible. We're just going to have a picture, and I believe as, as we look at these descriptions of Jesus, the Lord is going to speak to you. He's going to, he's going to bring something new into your life, a new beginning, a new freshness. He's going to encourage you with the promises of God, and he's going to cause his living water to wash over your soul this morning. From the Old Testament then, Jesus through the Bible. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman, our promised Savior. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and the one who gives us water in the desert. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet unto Moses who becomes a curse for us. In Joshua, he's the commander of the army of the Lord. In Judges, he's the lawgiver who delivers us from injustice. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he's all in one. He's our prophet, priest, and king. In 2 Samuel, he's the king of grace and the king of love. In 1 Kings, he's a ruler even greater than Solomon. In 2 Kings, he's He's the powerful prophet who proclaims the living word of God. In 1 Chronicles, he's the son of David that is coming to rule. In 2 Chronicles, he's the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, he's the priest who proclaims freedom. In the Nehemiah, he's the one who restores the broken walls of our lives. We heard this morning, it's time to stop living in the past or the experiences of the, of the past. It's time. Today is a new day. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Let God restore. Let God heal you. Let God deliver you. And you can leave from here this morning saying, this is a new day of salvation. Today, I'm going to allow Jesus to work in my life and in my ways. You know, whatever Satan has stolen, God is able to restore it. And the amazing thing about God, when he restores, it's always better than it originally was. Maybe you've let the devil steal from you. Maybe you've opened the doors in your life. I want you to know today, you can slam it back in his face in the name of Jesus and say, enough already. Today, I'm going to start serving God with all my heart. Maybe you're serving God properly this morning, but it's time to stand up and step in to those new things that God has for you. Can you say amen? One decision this morning can change everything. In Esther, he's the protector of the people. In Job, he's the mediator between God and man. In Psalms, he's our song in the morning, he's our song at night, and he's the great shepherd of his sheep. In Proverbs, he is our wisdom. How many of you need some wisdom this morning? 
I need a bit of wisdom in my life. Can you say amen? The Bible says in James 1, He who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally without fault finding. Let him ask in faith, and God will give you the wisdom you need for your life. In Ecclesiastes, he is the meaning of true life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the lover of our souls. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the weeping Messiah. In Lamentations, he's, he assumes God's wrath on behalf of the people. In Ezekiel, he is the son of man. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in our fiery furnace. He's the fourth man who shows up in your life when everything is falling apart. Jesus is there holding you, strengthening you, helping you in empowering you. In Hosea, he's a faithful husband to the backslider, and he's always ready to welcome you home. In Joel, he's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's the deliverer of justice to those who are oppressed. In Obadiah, he's the judge of those who do evil, and he's a helper to those who are in trouble. In Jonah, he is the greatest missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. He casts out our sin into the sea of forgetfulness. How many of you are happy that God remembers your sin no more? Can I just remind you, God is not forgetful. He just chooses not to remember. <laughs> Can you say amen? He remembers our sin no more. In Nahum, he's the burden bearer who declares future eternal peace for those who trust in him. In Habakkuk, he's the evangelist pleading for revival. He's the one who provides vision and brings perspective into the lives of his people. In Zephaniah, he's the warrior who saves. In Haggai, he's the restorer of the lost heritage of worship. In Zechariah, he's the fountain of life always open to the sinner and those who are unclean. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Let's go to the New Testament. Wow, I preached myself happy. In Matthew, he's the Messiah who is king. In Mark, he's the servant and wonder worker. In Luke, he's the Messiah who delivers his people. In John, he's the son of God in the flesh. In Acts, he's the spirit who dwells and works amongst his people, the church. In Romans, he's our righteousness. In 1 Corinthians, he's the power and the love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he's the down payment of the things still to come. In Galatians, he is our very life and he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, He's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he's the joy and the one who supplies all of your needs. In Colossians, he holds the su supreme position in all things in heaven and in earth. In 1 Thessalonians, he is our comfort in the last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he's the soon returning king. In 1 Timothy, he's the savior to the worst of sinners. In 2 Timothy, he's the leader of leaders. In Titus, he's the foundation of truth and he's the faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend to the oppressed and the mediator. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant, our great high priest. In James, he's the one who matures our faith and strengthens our lives with wisdom and understanding. In 1 Peter, he is the one who gives us hope in a time of suffering. I want you to know, the Bible is quite clear about faith, but I want you to know it says this, that without hope, faith has nothing to work with. I want to encourage you this morning, let hope come alive in your heart again. Start expecting God to do something new. Start expecting God to do something fresh in your life. Maybe the last two years have been difficult and you've battled through things, but today you can switch on the light of God's hope because his light is shining into the darkness this morning. Can you say amen? God wants to raise up a generation of people who are serious about serving him, who are serious about seeing him do miracles and signs and wonders. Can you say amen? I don't know about you, but I want to be one of those people. In second in Peter, he's the one who guards us from false teaching. In 1 John, he's the source of all our fellowship. In 2 John, he's God in the flesh. In 3 John, he's the source of all truth. In Jude, he protects us from stumbling and will return again with ten thousands of ten thousands of the saints. In Revelations, He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the soon coming King and He is the one who makes all things new. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who lifts us up. He's the one who will give us strength. He's our hope and He's our shield this morning. I don't know about you, but Jesus is fantastic. 
And I'm going to ask the worship team to come this morning. I know we, we kind of let worship finish early this morning, but we had a purpose because I really believe God wants us to pray for people this morning. I believe God's presence is here. And I believe God wants to just do something fresh and new in our lives. And he wants us to just uh, press in towards his presence and his power. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, it says this, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in Christ are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us, who establishes us with Christ and has anointed us with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you to stand to your feet this morning. If you've listened or watched this DVD today, and you'd like to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it would be such a privilege for me to lead you in the prayer of salvation from Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that Jesus Christ is your son, that you sent him into this world to die for me, and you raised him from the dead so that I could be saved. I open my heart and I accept Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. We'd also like to get a hold of your postal address so we can send you a Bible and some more information about what it means to be saved. We'd also encourage you to join a good word-based local church in your area. And if ever you're here on the South Coast, please pop in and visit us. God bless.